The wheels are spinning and we are live. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with The Magic Brad Show, and this is going to be a lot of fun. I've got a friend of mine that I met online, and uh, we did an earlier conversation, then we decided to do a series on here, and I'm going to give you a little sneak preview. This is what it is. It's Deb Brown Maher, and she's got a book, Sell Like Jesus, and today we're going to be talking about lead generation and uh, using biblical principles to generate leads for your business. So I'm going to pop this out, and we're going to bring Deb on. So just a few moments. Nice round of applause. Please bring her on. Her name is Deb. Heather, how are you? Hello, doing? Brad. How are you? Oh, I forgot. You're over on the East Coast, aren't you? I am, yes. How is the weather over there? Is it warm? It is still warm, although it's a little cooler than Texas. So <laughs> we, We've yeah. had a little bit. Well, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we've had a little bit of snap, and it's kind of weird. It's almost frost. It's only well, my, sis my sister's in Dallas, and she keeps telling me, well, I took a walk last night because it was only 93 degrees. Yeah, <laughs> not my cup of tea. <laughs> Well, let's get right into it and not waste much time here. We've got some Good. people that are going to be watching live, and then there's other people that will be able to get the recording because we record this so that uh, if someone for some reason couldn't make it, we can send them the recording and they can check it out. So today Perfect. we're going to be talking about lead generation and your book. Let me pop that up there one more time. The book is called Sell Like Jesus, and it's basically based on like biblical principles. Am I right? That is right. Yes, having been in sales most of my life, ever since I was young, um, it was always important to me to treat people kindly and also be successful. And there were a lot of conflicting models of high pressure sales that really did not sit well with me. So over the years, studying all different kinds of sales approaches, I came to discover that Jesus was actually the master model of how to be a servant leader in a sales role. So I looked at what he did and how he did it and applied that to selling and helping people learn about what it is that you have to offer to see if there's a good fit. And if there is, great, we'll do business together. And if there isn't, then we will kindly shake hands and agree to part ways because it, it doesn't work for both of us. So the high pressure sales, you're talking about kind of like those timeshare sales where they get you all emotionally into it and then there's buyer's remorse when they found out what they did? Exactly. And you bring up a good point there. What high pressure does is it gets people into an emotional state. So they're making the buying decision emotionally when in fact, we all have to rationalize the purchase intellectually because we have limited budget and we have to also make sure, do our research be comfortable that what we're actually buying will do what we need it to do, what we think it can do. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious, how did you all of a sudden come upon this idea of using biblical principles for a, a businessy kind of thing. Because I remember the there was a situation where there was Jesus was in the marketplace and he didn't like the way the traders were exchanging money and they had a chaos. <laughs> yes. So I originally got the idea when I was working with my own coach. Um, if you're going to be a coach for a living, it's also good to submit to the same coaching process that I use with others. And my coach said one day, Deb, you ought to write a book. And thinking kind of quickly in the moment, I said, I have no idea what I would write about unless it would be how to sell like Jesus. And actually, Brad, the, uh, the idea was born right there. And I said that because I didn't want to write a book that was just another sales technique book. I wanted to write something that had not been written about before. And I could not find any books that showed the scriptural backing for sales technique. 
so let's just take a really simple, everybody's going to know this scripture, whether you know the Bible or not, the golden rule. That's mm -hmm. actually from the book of Matthew. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, common sense says, if I don't like to be pressured, then I'm not going to pressure someone else because I don't like when it's done to me. Sure. So you also have to be able to balance making sales. So what's the right kind of pressure? Well, the right kind of pressure is the pressure the person puts on themselves, not the kind of pressure you put on them. Right. So if it's their idea, they're the only ones who can really make the decision. Is this worth the time, effort and energy? Can I spend this money now? Is it a good investment? Am I willing to make changes? Because no matter what you're buying into, change is always part of the deal. Sure. <laughs> Even if it's something good that's coming, there's so still the, the role adjustments. The so then the role of the salesperson is really more to take the pressure off of the process as opposed to putting it on. Exactly. And, and that's a tricky thing to do when all of the experiences we've had being sold to right. are, are the high pressure. And we remember, wow, that was horrible. I don't want to experience that again. But then what do I do if I don't do that? What do I do instead? And it really comes down to building relationships. And I know that might sound trite, that's nothing new, right? We all know that the, the better our relationships are, the better we understand each other, the easier it is to trust. And if it's a purchasing situation to buy, but there are ways that we are, we have to be good at building relationships quickly in what starts out as an adversarial situation. Okay. That, that buyer-seller situation has tension from the get-go. So we have to be able to quickly establish trust. And you can't do that by saying, you can trust me, honest, I'm a Christian, you can trust me. Yeah, right, everybody will run the other direction as soon as you say that. It's a red flag. So. Don't listen to what people say, watch what they do. We have yeah. to model the behavior that will help people trust us. So the relationship thing, it's, it's very important, especially these days on the internet, because there's so, it be the trust factor. So you really know how have to build that relationship up, an honest, sincere, you know, genuine relationship. Yes, and good point. The, the whole landscape has changed, hasn't it? That's actually what's coming up next week. We're going to be talking about relationships. Well, but we, we'll won't, get we won't get too much into that right now. <laughs> well, I'm going to segue back to what we're talking about now, which is lead generation, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we're forced now to generate leads electronically. And how do you, how do you build a relationship electronically? Hmm. Well, it starts with, knowing who your ideal audience is sure, and being very purposeful going after that audience. Um, what are the mistakes I see many, I won't say most or all, but many salespeople make is thinking everyone's a prospect. Right. And the more prospects I have, the better. In reality, everyone is not a prospect. They're a suspect. I suspect they might be able to become a prospect. And that's where the internet actually helps us allow people to self-select from suspect to prospect, and maybe even walk a couple steps down the prospect chain until it's time to have a conversation. And that's where we'll get next week when we talk more in depth about building relationships. That really comes through dialogue. But before we get there, we have to get people's attention and we want to get the right people's attention. Because I don't know, Brad, have you ever worked with someone that 
afterwards you felt like you needed to fire them? Like <laughs> you're really sorry that you ever started the engagement? Has that ever happened to you? Oh, for sure. The, the kind of customer that you want to get rid of, uh, absolutely. Because you didn't really, I think, get into the in depth of why you're selling them. Absolutely. Right. Like the, the customer that you, that's always asking for more, right? Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, for the same price. More. But let me price. put your um, book title up here so that if they if, sure. if someone tunes in and they got to get going, at least they see it right there. Thank you that's very much. How you can find uh, that's where you can learn more about sell like jesus.com. That's Excellent. where you can about the book. Perfect. So, when it comes to generating leads, the best way if you've not done this thought work, you need to start here. So get out a piece of paper and a pen if you don't have it already and take some notes. Start with looking at who your favorite clients are today. What are the characteristics that they have that you would love to find other people like them and write those things down? So thinking about the ideal, the person you love to work with, the one that you had fun working with, the one that you were able to discover above and beyond what you thought they actually needed at the start. And it just grew and you were, be, you were able to become more and more valuable to them. What is it about them? What are the characteristics that they have? that you would like to find in other prospects. Things to think about are character traits. What are some of the character traits they have? How do they demonstrate their values? What are the values that you're looking for? It's interesting, one of, one of the things that, as I do workshops on this topic, people will uh, often start by saying, I wanna work with somebody who pays my bill. Yep. <laughs> uh-huh. It's someone who values you and the product or service that you bring, and they are happy to pay you for it. That's that's a quality that not everybody has. Now, sometimes that might not be a person, but it might be the character and the values of a company. Absolutely. Yeah. Because everything that we're talking about here has to do with not just be business to consumer sales, but also business to business sales. And if a business is concerned about how they treat their customers, then chances are they're gonna treat you as a vendor similarly. So looking at, at their customer reactions to them. That's good to know that you, especially if someone does like global sales, once you get that, that, that profile of who your ideal customer is, you can probably find those people all over the place. Like, when I was doing event stuff, we had a customer that just, uh, here's the budget, it's $20,000. The theme of the event is the Blue Danube, make it so. And that's all uh -huh. we had to do was just, it was ready to go. And it was a real, they, they paid the bill in advance and we just did it. And that's the ideal customer. So how do I find more exactly like that, right? It is. It sounds like they had a high trust level with you. Yeah. Was there a previous experience that came first yep, absolutely in fact it was my my partner's past client so they brought we brought them in when we started the company and yeah so it was easy working with them because that trust factor was there and the reputation and all that and it was uh, it was very simple to do <laughs> and sometimes it takes time to build that trust factor it doesn't just happen in the first meeting so um laying the groundwork for that to happen is very important Another thing that you want to think about with your ideal prospects is locale. Is the geography important? Is the age group important? Do you work more with men or women or both with 20 somethings, 30 somethings, 40 somethings, 50 somethings, 60 somethings, etc.? So, how I'm going to recommend that you write out characteristics that narrow who you're looking for seven different ways. So if you haven't, if you've never done this, 
keep narrowing until you have seven characteristics that describe your ideal prospect. Got it, yeah. In, in the online world, they call it creating the, the customer avatar. Exactly. They're creating yes. a, you know, so you know exactly who it is. The person is like uh, 25 years old, has two kids, is divorced and uh, likes golf. It gets really niched down and then you just kind of duplicate that. Right. <laughs> Very good. And so even on that, in my book, Sound Like Jesus. That's what it looks like. On That's what it looks like when you see it on Amazon. Page 21, um, I talk about Jesus had a target audience. Did you realize uh, Jesus wasn't trying to reach everyone during the three years he took his offering public? His target audience was narrow and specific as seen in the instructions that he gave his disciples in Matthew 10, 6 and 7, where he said, don't go into any non-Jewish or Samaritan territory. Go instead and find the lost sheep among the people of Israel. He was talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. There were a whole lot more people on the earth during Jesus' lifetime than the Jewish people represented. They were a very small percentage, yet he confined his work to that small niche. And it wasn't until eight years later that his disciples actually started expanding beyond the Jewish people to talk to other people groups. You know, that uh, helps a lot because I think a lot of people get overwhelmed with thinking, how, how am I gonna get these 10,000 people into my database when maybe you just need seven? Right. Very and cool. then work with those seven, get a reputation with those seven and get them to tell you who they know that you could be talking to. Right. Now you're going to leverage the right kind of referral business because that's the other uh, beauty of narrowing the, the market niche that you're going after they are going to refer people who are like they are when you do work outside of your niche and they give you a referral now you're starting to get tied into doing that work which is it isn't necessarily what you want to be doing it's splintered off of your core offerings and anytime you dilute your core you run a risk now if it develops into a big enough niche fine and you can accommodate that, that's great. That could be a new venture that you can add to your current offerings. But start out narrow, do well as well as you possibly can for that narrow niche, and then think about expanding intelligently based on the kind of questions, the kind of prospects that are approaching you outside of that niche, because they'll find you. Your target audience, you typically have to work harder to find your target than the non-target. They all find you anyway. Here's, here's a comment from Chris. Yes. And Chris says, pricing yourself out of a commission doesn't work either. That is absolutely right. They, now pricing, hmm, pricing is another whole topic. Um, one of the challenges that I have had shifting gears into doing more group online work. The, I'm accustomed to doing one-on-one -on -one coaching or small group in-person coaching that I customize for the companies that I work with. And that comes at a price tag that many people can't afford. So mm -hmm. I have, one of the reasons I wanted a book was because it gave me a, a entry level price point to reach hundreds, thousands, maybe even a million, millions of people around the world. That would be ideal eventually. Um, at, at, so I can get some information that's helpful that'll help people take steps along their way um, through the book. I'm also working towards, um, this, this is uh, an introduction to Sell Like Jesus. I'm working towards a a workshop series that I will be charging for, but it will be at a price point much lower than bringing me in to do custom work at the company. So we have to be 
price sensitive to the marketplace and understand who can afford what price and then approach accordingly. So if I am giving the wrong message to, or the right message to the wrong audience or turn it around the other way, it's a mismatch and I'm gonna be disappointed in the results. And yeah, so I guess uh, pricing is also relevant to the generation of the lead because you don't want to be generating a bunch of leads that you've either overpriced or underpriced because you can underprice your stuff too where someone looks at it like that's worthless. It couldn't be worth anything because it's so cheap. Yes. Yes, and I happen to know Chris is an artist. Artists have a very challenging time putting a price on right. their work. It's because they love what they're doing so much. They think I can't possibly charge for this. I had so much fun. I enjoyed it so much. How could I really charge for it? And they don't look at it from the other, the recipient point of view. And sometimes the time involved is massive. Yeah. I know when I do watercolor, I can spend 60 hours on one painting. That's a lot of time. How really? do you put a price tag on that? Yeah. Well, when I was living in Asheville, North Carolina, there's a guy, as I can't remember his name right off the top of my head, but uh, he painted, he did painting demonstrations and it only took him about 20 minutes to do what he did because he did all sorts of fancy throwing the paint all over stuff. And yeah. he was selling these things for like $15,000. They're like 10 by 10 square things, but um, it didn't take him very long to do it. So he's functioning totally off his reputation and the experience of being there. So it's it's the perceived value of something is totally different for certain people. And unfortunately the artist ends up uh, kind of putting themselves down thinking that, uh, you know, I did it while I was having fun. It's not worth that much. Yeah. So the, what the better picture we have of our ideal customer, the easier it is to avoid that disappointment. Right. Um, I, I know that pricing artwork in central Pennsylvania, you get about 50% what you could charge in other parts of the United States. Different communities value art differently. It comes back to what you said about that, Brad. D value is in the eye of the beholder. Totally, look at uh, Coca-Cola. It's just sugar water with bubbles in it and they sell it for six bucks. Yep. <laughs> at a convention. Yep. So do you have a little worksheet or something that you'd show me before? Is that a, like a checklist of, uh, of topics? What's the I, I do. I have defining your ideal business to business customers. This could also be adapted to business to consumer. And what I've done is break out. There are um, five areas to consider. The first one is who are your favorite clients? We've talked about that. Second one is what are their character attributes? We talked about that. Third is demographics and psychographics. So what does that mean? Oh. Um, it's values, it's timeliness of payments, it's how uh, companies treat their employees and how they treat their customers. So the psychology as well as the demography are things that you want to consider. Um, the fourth is what questions can you ask to qualify someone to find out if they're your perfect customer? Oh. This is, this is where it, this is where you can begin. Once you formulate some of those questions, what, what you're going to do is start prompting people to think about, am I experiencing a gap that this person has a solution for? So the question should prompt, have you ever wished you had that, just that perfect piece of artwork that was, it had the right colors and the right design, but you, you just couldn't find it anywhere? See, there's a question to prompt to see, has anybody ever felt that way? So yeah. asking the questions draws the information out. I know a friend of mine used to teach exhibitors how to exhibit, and he talked about Emerson's six friends, the who, what, where, when, how, and why. Right. Yes, those questions, it draws that information out, and it gets a person to start thinking. Right. Hmm, that's why I want that piece of art. <laughs> exactly. Or in that case, you might be setting yourself up to do custom artwork. 
So it's tailored to the individual and people will pay a premium for that because they want to talk to the artist and have input on the painting. They want to be able to dictate the color scheme so it fits their decor, mm -hmm. perhaps even the subject. Not everybody cares about that, right? So your questions are integral to helping bubble up to the surface who fits your ideal customer characteristics. Yeah, the uh, quick story is there's a guy at a trade show, he's at a communications trade show, he's buying a phone system for his company. And the salesperson was telling him about all these features and benefits and how this is great. And the guy ended up buying the one with the big buttons. And the salesperson wondered, why did you get that? It's the same price and all it has is big buttons. It doesn't have all these fancy features. And the guy said, I'm in the construction industry. Our guys have big hands, they got big fingers, they need big buttons. So the, the salesperson didn't even ask, why do you want that phone? And if you ask the right questions, you can make the sale a lot faster probably. And not it, it works in to the favor of both. Now that guy got what he wanted because it simply was available. But what really if, <laughs> what if that the salesman didn't have that phone out? It was in a drawer. Sure. So the buyer never saw it. So if you're not asking the questions, you know, how are you going to be using this phone? And what are the features that you're looking for? What would make it the ideal phone for you to buy? It, right. Just those questions are going to prompt responses that help you as the salesperson start to understand what's motivating this purchase. You know they're motivated because they're talking to you, but what exactly motivated them? That's what we need to know. The, the more we know, the better we know that, the better we can offer the right solution or realize that we don't have what they want or need, in which case we might be able to help them get it. We might be able to refer them to someone or we might say in six months from now, I may have that. Would you like me to get back in touch with you? Depending on what the truth, the reality is. In and that's world. where do on to others or did you expect to be done unto you? Because if you treat them like a jerk because they didn't, you know, you didn't have the product for them and they leave and you go, well, I don't need you anyways. I'll just sell to somebody else. Right. That's good. That person's probably not going to come back next month. You know, got to be nice. No, they won't because you insulted them. That's right. So, you can't afford right. it anyways. so even when the sale isn't made, still being of service, being kind, treating, as you said, treating them the way you yourself would want to be treated. Yeah. Let me put your other uh, thing up here for just sales in general, Deb Brown sales right there, debbrownsales.com. That's just uh, not not to do with the book, but who knows? Maybe somebody wants to, isn't looking for the book. They want to talk with you and consult with you. So put that one up. Absolutely. There. And uh, I'll mention that the first half hour is free, always. There we go. Really, no strings attached. I'm and happy to bring relevant some. to value. It's a valuable half hour just because it's free. Does it? It's because you're kind, right? <laughs> Thank you. You have some more uh, check boxes or buttons on your, your list for today so we don't get uh, too long. I'm not sure how much more you got to, to share with us. So I, I do, I'll wrap up by giving uh, some advice. Hmm. Have a systematic approach to reach your target audience. Systematic and consistent approach. One of the challenges many of us have if, if you're a solo entrepreneur, a freelancer, or a business owner, you're wearing a lot of hats. You have a lot to do. And if you don't really like sales, it will get pushed to the back burner and forgotten about because there's all these other really important things that need to get done. <laughs> so it's important to have a structured approach, write down your approach, make it doable, make it doable. Don't, don't try to push yourself to do more than you can. The trick is a little bit every day, consistently over time. So if you are not spending dedicated time on trying to find new prospects today, 
dedicate half hour a day, an hour a day, whatever you can fit into your schedule and then keep doing across a long period of time, you're gonna be way ahead of people who do things in fits and spurts. And I understand the tendency is I'm busy getting new business. Oop, now I gotta fulfill what I sold. So I'm busy working to fulfill the business so I don't have time to do sales. That kind of sets us up for this instead of right. a steady. Yeah. I was just going to ask about that for like more the upper management of sales, like a sales manager. Do you think that it's wise to like create these like um, blitz bonuses and you got to, you know, meet that quota and pushing the salesperson or you should you let them kind of just cruise and. Well, there is an interesting thing that happens when you're in a larger company and you have monthly goals you know that a day or two before the month is out, there's going to be a push to reach those goals. So I understand the blitzes. I understand the, the kind of race for the finish. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that if that's the only time you put the full court press on your sales effort, you're back in that yeah, you can yeah. get a little sloppy at what you do. If you got a nice system going and you're courteous, you might be pushing a little bit too fast and you're not, you, for, you forget right. to say please and thank you. Yes. And depending on your business, the sales cycle might be shorter or longer. I've worked with people that have a one call close, so they make the sale or not. And all the way up to multiple years. So if you get into commercial real estate sales, for example, or even some uh, law firms, the, the nature of the legal work they do, it doesn't happen every day. So they're building relationships that they need to maintain over a long period of time until an opportunity of need actually arises. So it, it depends a lot on what you're selling, uh, as to what that sales cycle will look like. However, the core principles sell like Jesus. Those are pretty much, they stay there, even though different products have different methods and things, but the core principles are, are biblically sound. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, Deb, I'm going to close this one off and then beam it up to the universe so people can find it. I'm going to put your uh, domain name back on there. So, I appreciate you taking the time. And then next month or next week, we're going to be talking about the whole relationship project process. And that's going to be exciting to me because I think that's pretty much the, the most important part of sales. Because if you got a good, solid relationship, kind of like that client that we had, there is no having to close the sale. You know, the old ABC, right. always be closing. It isn't high pressure. It just happens <laughs> because of the relationship. Yes. Right? Yes. So let me offer to anybody that would like the worksheet that I was working from, just send me an email to deb at debbrownsales.com. And I'd be happy to get that out to you. Deb at debbrownsales.com. Perfect. Thank I you, will. Brad. Well, thank you. And we'll see you again next week. If you want to stay in the green room, uh, while I sign this off, we can have a little bit of a chat because I don't got okay. a lot. Okay. Sounds good. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. See you again next week. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and berries, let's hear it for Deb Brown. We appreciate that. I think that's a very interesting concept of taking something that's uh, literally been principles for thousands of years and implementing them into the sales process instead of some of these processes that I've seen, these high pressure, like I use the reference of timeshare sales. Unfortunately, that model or car salesman, they got kind of a bad rap. But if they use those, uh, you know, be kind and do unto others as you'd expect to be done to you. I think uh, the sales process can be much easier and a lot less buyer's remorse. So boys and berries, I appreciate you taking the time. I'm going to sign this off. This is Magic Brad with dun, 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 the Magic Brad Show. Thank you very much. And uh, tune in next week. We'll be back Wednesday at 1 p.m. Central Time. Thank you. Peace. <laughs>